Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Welcome to our thoughts for the day. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Good morning and welcome to the service in Gridiron Presbyterian Church. Today is a service of remembrance for those who have lost their lives in, well, we remember primarily the Great Wars, uh, but all the conflict since. We recognize those who have died in the conflict in Northern Ireland and the troubles of those who are engaged in conflict at the minute in Ukraine and Gaza uh, and in wars across the world. We recognize that war uh, means that human ability and peace has run out and what we are left with is open conflict. And so today we're going to be thinking about peace uh, and Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace to the backdrop of having to remember those who have fallen on battlefields around the world. We'll take some time during our service uh, to remember if I can get the technology to work. Uh, to remember the lost, uh, we will try and use it's quite an old video now from the British Legion of two minute silence and some images. But it draws in images of politicians and sports people and musicians, as well as soldiers and service men and women and personnel across the world. A kind of a reminder that we all stand together in this act of remembrance for those who lost their lives and those who have survived war, but whose lives have been changed forever. So hopefully those will work during our service as well. To move into our worship this morning, uh, I'm going to read from Psalm 28. And it kind of feels like a psalm where somebody is feeling put upon, oppressed and under the hand of an enemy and cries out to God to be their strength and their shield, their protection. And we read this psalm at the start of our service. And maybe this will be our prayer for those who are struggling under conflict at the minute. And may it lead us into our worship, remembering that God is our protector, our eternal protector, because even though we may lose our lives here, he holds us in eternity forever. But Psalm 28. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, do not be deaf to me. Lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who be down to the pent. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands towards your most holy sanctuary. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. But wherever we find ourselves today, may we find that the Lord is our strength and our shield. And may we lay our trust in him. And our response this morning is that of worship again. With our song, I give thanks to him. Well, let us do that as we sing our first hymn together.
Let's break the silence on the two minute silence and pause. You see, it's not about which side of the argument you side with. Think of it as an act of kindness. You may not know their names, you may never meet them face to face, but imagine what it must feel like to never again see the face of your brother or your best mate. Imagine all you had left was the pictures they left on Facebook or a backpack full of their old school books. This is more than some war in your history textbook. You don't have to agree with the politicians. You don't have to like their decisions, but you can decide to empathize. And yeah, it can be awkward just standing there, but try this. Try closing your eyes. Remember those who risk their lives knowing every second might be their last. So if we give them a second or two minutes, is that really too much to ask? Let that football roll to a stop. Let your conversation reach a full stop. Mute your phone, close the laptop, pause your coffee, switch off the telly. Because when it comes to empathy, we can all stand at the front line. And on 11-11, we can all choose to unite. We need to talk about the silence and then pause. Lest we forget, this moment is ours. Our readings today are taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 through to 7. And then we're going to read Matthew, chapter 5, verse 1 through to verse 12. And then we'll pray together after that. But here's God's word in the Old and New Testaments. Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in, in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Matthew chapter 5. 
Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. So, For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Well, let us pray together now this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come to this remembering day, this day of remembrance, we bring before you those, those conflicts that we know we're ongoing today. We pray for the war in Ukraine. And maybe slipped from our TVs and newspaper because of the conflict in Israel, but still going on, Father. Still men and women losing their lives, losing their homes, losing their communities. We pray for an end to that conflict. We pray for peace. Father, we pray for the conflict in Israel, in the area of Gaza. And again, we pray for those on both sides of this conflict who have lost loved ones, who have lost homes, who have lost work, who have lost communities. We pray for an end to the violence. We pray for a way for peace to come about. We pray for those in all these conflicts, Father, and those ongoing that we don't even know about in Africa and beyond, Father. We pray for those who are carrying brutal injuries and scars, both physically and mentally, as a result of these conflicts. We pray for their healing and their recovery. We pray for soldiers who are on front lines of either side of these conflicts, Father. We pray for their safety and their return home to their families without wound and without harm. We pray for governments and officials, peacemakers, to be drawn into these conflicts and those beyond, Father, to help navigate places of opposition, both geographically, uh, historically, religiously. Uh, Father, we're just bringing peacemakers who are able to navigate those difficult and inflammatory backgrounds to find a way forward to peace. So raise up godly, wise, graceful, patient, kind men and women who can speak into the darkness of war. Lord, for all those service men and women who are preparing for conflict tonight, we pray for their safety wherever they find themselves. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now that Halloween is over, many of our heads begin to turn towards Christmas. And I know uh, that some of you, like me, find that both terrifying and mind-boggling. But there it is. And so maybe it's right that today we introduced our first Christmas reading, if you will, the prophecy that we uh, find in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 that speaks about the one to come. These are probably these great messianic prophecies that we find in Isaiah, but the one to come and who he is and what he will accomplish. Um, I was read for us uh, this morning and it included that verse. Uh, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince 
of peace. It's an incredible prophecy that speaks directly to the deity of the one to come. Those words like mighty God, everlasting father. To any Jew, you know, any Jewish prophet, you know, speaking these words out, um, it, 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 the, the idea that they're going to speak these about a man is unthinkable. These are the words of God. So they're prophesying that God is going to come, which is staggering uh, in itself. Um, and we've got over the next two months to kind of dwell on the likes of a passage like this and what it says about what our God has done in the incarnation, in Bethlehem, in the nativity. You know, it's a staggering thing that Isaiah is prophesying. But today I want to focus particularly on one of the titles that relates to the day we find ourselves in today and what we commemorate. And that is the title Prince of Peace. We have been reminded afresh by the war in Ukraine uh, and Israel that peace is a fragile commodity. It took us as a country around 40 years to get to the level of peace that we currently enjoy. And why do we still have these wars and conflicts 2,000 years after Jesus Christ came to be the Prince of Peace? Surely that means that there should be no more war or, or conflict going on in the world. But that really depends on what we understand Jesus, um, Jesus is coming as bringing us peace from. Because if we follow the narrative of the scriptures, what we discover is that all war and conflict, all violence um, and oppression, they, these are mere symptoms of the greater central problem that all of us have. And that is the problem of sin in each and every one of our lives. There is no war begun that did not have a, a sin as its root. Whether that be arrogance, pride, greed, envy, anger, etc, etc, etc. And those sins birth further sins of things like deceit and lies and violence and murder that we see located in war. And if we look properly, what we discover is that most of these sins are sins of relationship. They're about how we relate to one another. They involve how we see others and what others have. So many of our wars are built on greed and envy. I want what you have. I should have what you have, be it land or resources, oil, wealth. I want what you have. And so in my arrogance, I believe that I should be allowed to take it. And when Jesus came as the Prince of Peace, he came to address the root cause of the problem, not just the symptom. He came to address the issue of sin and the damage it brings in regard to our relationships. And our relationships, I think, in three areas. Primarily our relationship with God. Our relationship then with one another and our relationship with ourselves. Jesus' purpose in the incarnation was to bring peace and reconciliation within those relationships. A reconciliation none of us are able to achieve on our own. And then having been reconciled with the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit, he brings about a transformation within us. And this changes how we perceive ourselves and ourselves in regard to the Father. Many of our conflicts are due to our understandings of ourselves things like envy and arrogance are about how i see the world and how i see others within the world but when we are reconciled to the father it transforms how we see ourselves jesus called on us to imitate him in being servant hearted our role was to see ourselves as the servants of others as the servants of, 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 of our lord and heavenly father when Jesus wrapped that towel around his waist and knelt at the disciples' feet to wash their feet, he was showing us how we should see ourselves in the world. We are servants of the King. We, we are servants of others. We live to enable the lifting up and thriving of others. Who with a mindset of humility and servant-heartedness ever started a war or perpetrated a war crime? If I see myself and others in the image of God, then who do I hate or, or, or am envious of or, or, or am I angry at? Jesus is the Prince of 
peace. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Son of God. And yet he is the one who made himself a servant. He could have been, you know, if anybody had the right to be proud and arrogant, you know, it was Jesus. And yet he was the one who stepped out of heaven into human form to die on a cross for us. He is the one who came to be the servant king, the sacrificial lamb. Us being co-heirs with Christ and having been saved by Christ, we are called to live lives like him of humility, gentleness, patience, kindness. What, what conflict was ever started by someone like that? When we begin to understand ourselves and who we are, it transforms how we understand ourselves and it brings peace to who we are. Enable us to be reconciled with ourselves. When we find this word peace frequently as the word shalom in the Old Testament, it talks about this sense of completeness, the sense of complete inner peace is one part of it, but it's a wholeness. And, and when we're fully reconciled to ourselves through Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we find this completeness, this peace, this shalom within us but only through the wholeness that is brought through reconciliation with the Father, through Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when we grow within us this humility, gentleness, kindness, forgiveness, grace, well, whoever started a war from that kind of posture or position. This is the peace that Jesus brings us he brings us peace with God. He brings us peace with ourselves, transforming and working out of our hearts that which is corrupt and broken. Like, to, like working a scale fight bit by bit, one by one, he removes the brokenness within us. But nowhere, and interesting, nowhere in the scriptures um, does privilege with God, and that's what we have, we have a privileged relationship with God, uh, equate to sitting on our laurels. God does not become reconciled with us in order for us to wall ourselves off from the world and say, well, you guys crack on destroying yourselves. We're all going to sing here in a circle making daisy chains uh, and singing little nice Christian songs. No, in the Beatitudes, he reminds us of the task we have. We have received the, the, the blessing of being reconciled to God and to ourselves, and so we must become peacemakers in our world and this comes into now our relationship with others and let's understand what this does not mean it does not mean that we have the capacity to bring about world peace through helping reconciliation with others that will only occur when christ returns and breaks sin and death once and for all but until he comes he calls on us as living extensions of his kingdom to act as peacemakers wherever we find ourselves and notice that that's, that's active language. We are not to be peace applauders standing on the edge and go, oh, that, that, that peace would be great. No one, if you imagine, like a car manufacturer, a car maker like Ford. Like what is, what is the very heart of what they do? Well, they make cars. There's a factory. There's a process. There's engineering. It, you know, they make cars they do stuff you would you couldn't go along to a ford factory and, and you go in there's just a massive empty barn and then still say oh well they're a car manufacturer they're a car maker because it makes no sense because they're not making any cars you know a car maker is someone who makes cars it's active there's a process there's an end result you know and and the same with us where we come across conflict we are to be active in our peace making. This is where we step into the realm of healing conflict between each other. As we've said, there can be no total peace until Christ returns. But that should never stop us working for, praying for, campaigning for peace from wars. And it must never stop us from working at relationships at every level of our lives. Like when we are meant to be peacemakers, it's not just in the grand scale of, of inter intercontinental conflict. We are meant to be working at relationships at every level in our lives of bringing about reconciliation and forgiveness and grace. 
from the relationships in our home when they break down, the relationships in our families when they break down, the relationships in our work when they break down, the relationships in our social lives when they break down, the relationships in our church when they break down. And if God brings us into circles where we're able to mend divisions on a larger community or social scale, well, we do not shirk away from that. We work as peacemakers even there. Notice that we're not called to be peace preservers. Now, this might sound a little bit counterintuitive because surely we want peace to be preserved. On one hand, yes, if it is a peace that is sustainable and that is God honoring. But often people do not address obvious wrongs in the desire to preserve the peace. People will say, oh, don't rock the boat or don't open that can of worms. But if preserving peace actually enables wrong and evil to thrive and grow, then we must speak up. We must bring about peace almost by breaking peace, by, by seeing something torn down in order to be rebuilt. We must become active in our peacemaking. Look at the civil rights movement in America. Some could have said to the black communities, look, look, just if you guys just kind of live quietly, you know, everything I'm sure will work itself out. But they would have still had to live lives under social injustice. And so the likes of Martin Luther King pursued non-violent resistance. They knew that true peace, true peace could only come from genuine equality. And they pursued that peace in a non-violent manner, even though it cost many of them their lives. Because again, being a peacemaker is about risk taking. You know, so many Presbyterian ministers through the Troubles took risks. You know, they met with Republicans seeking to bring about peace. Uh, they, they worked at the, at, 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 at the, at the um, conflict lines. Uh, you know, I did my assistantship up in Tordale and and Presbyterian ministers involved in those in those hot conflict zones. You know, David Trimble and John Hume in our story sacrificed much to work on the Good Friday Agreement. And whether you agree with it or not, it moved peace forward. It cost Trimble certainly his political career after that point. Seeking to be a, a, a peacemaker is a risky business. But as I look at the Gospels, well, well, Jesus was willing to put himself in the firing line to bring about my peace with God wasn't he he went to the cross to bring about my peace to bring about reconciliation between the father and myself and others being a peacemaker frequently costs the cost of peace is often high we come today in our service to remember that peace is rarely passive and it's rarely cheap it requires action and on occasions the cost is high. But when did God call us to do anything less than that? When did he call us to be any, any, any less than? When did he call us to be uh, shrinking away or being passive? Is there something that I've missed in the Gospels where Jesus said I have come to make your life easy? Is there something that I've missed where it said, I have come to save you so that you now have to do nothing with your life? No, he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus was the Prince of Peace. He came to reconcile us to the Father, to one another and to ourselves. He also left that charge with us when he called us to work in his image, calling us to be peacemakers, regardless of the cost. We see many symbols of peace in these days of remembrance, the poppy, the graves of the lost service men and women, the lone soldier head bowed. May we also see the cross of Christ as the great symbol of peace and be reminded of the cost of peace. And may we ever work in its shadow to become peacemakers. Amen.
as we draw our service to a close. I pray that you leave this place knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the presence of the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.